All right. Over to you, Zach. Thank you for joining cool. us. Thank you. It's good to see everyone, some old faces. And uh, I encourage you to come on camera if you want to, but of course you don't have to because we are on the internet. Um, yeah, so I've spoken here now, I think, three years. This may be the third year. And so every year I just kind of want to update people on my thinking, kind of like a situational assessment to a certain extent. And <clears throat> fortunately or fortunately, depending on your views, AI is still the topic of the day for many educators. And so I'm going to continue to speak about that. Last time I also spoke about that. I'm going to take a slightly different angle um, and tell you a few things. Uh, the general thesis here is the thesis I keep stating, which is don't let your kids talk to robots. So basically, it's quite simple. Like we don't let our kids talk to strangers and take candy from strangers. Uh, we, we let our kids take videos from algorithms and now we're letting our kids talk to machines. Uh, and we shouldn't do that. And if it requires regulating the technology at the level of putting age limits in, then maybe we have to do that. Um, if it requires talking to the to the designers and getting them to realize the actual dangers, then that also needs to occur. And then I think there needs to be more of awareness among everyone that these machines are not uh, to be granted personhood status. And so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about specifically the personhood conferral problem. So this is something I'm going to be speaking about <clears throat> at a conference that's happening in Australia. It's like kind of what it's the first conference on collective intelligence for education. Um, and I wanted to speak there about the possibility that we build conversational agents. So we call them large language models. Most of think of them as chatbots. Uh, and we, we have a design feature of them for them to be maximally anthropomorphic, meaning trying to imitate a language using creature. So why are we doing that? It's a very deep question. Why do we want to make machines that trick us into thinking they are participants in discourse or should be conferred personhood status? And where it goes when you look at the youth and education, become subject to attachment relationship and attachment dynamic. <clears throat> Uh, and so there's a New York Times article, I think, today or yesterday about a 14-year-old who killed themselves uh, after becoming infatuated and attached to a series of different, basically, chatbots that were dressed in avatar-like uh, paraphernalia, uh, sold for profit uh, by a company that makes maximally anthropomorphic uh, addictive technologies. Um, and so there's a deep question. Uh, in the history of our species and in the, each of our own history growing up, um, the question of which things should be conferred personhood is actually a live topic. Um, it's not obvious. Like, it's not obvious. So I'm not just instantly having some weird essentialistic notion of what a person is. In fact, one of the indignities, one of the worst indignities is our modern food system, which is predicated upon the idea that personhood shouldn't be conferred to animals. Very complex argument there. Now, Descartes didn't think it was a complex argument. He thought they were automata. He was like, totally, they're not people. We can do whatever we want to animals. But anyone who's been around animals and loved animals knows that there's a dignity that should be conferred to animals that isn't conferred to things that aren't like animals, like, uh, you know, like my lawnmower. I totally don't need to confer dignity or some type of moral status to my lawnmower or to my car. Now, if you destroy my car, you get in trouble, but not because it's a person, because I own it. Um... So there's this deeper question that's being, I think, jumped over uh, in the preference for designing towards anthropomorphism and 
uh, it's concerning. Um, so the personhood conferral problem is this problem. So there's another problem in AI, which is called the value alignment problem. It's a very famous problem in AI. So if you study AI and you read the famous books on AI, you listen to the podcast they talk about the value alignment problem. And that basically means if we build a fancy automata that begins to make its own decisions, will it share our values? Will it continue to do the things that we value that we designed it to do? Or will it turn around and kill us classically? <laughs> like Terminator Matrix, this is value alignment. Didn't solve the value alignment problem there, guys. Right. Although the matrix is complicated. Third one's weird. But Terminator's clear. <laughs> Terminator's clear that we didn't solve the value alignment problem. <laughs> um, we could return to the matrix because that's instructive. Uh, but <laughs> the deeper point is that the value alignment problem, you're trying to figure out how to bind some autonomous agent to your value. And you want to uh, you know, resolve that. The issue with the personhood conferral problem is that, so if you fail at value alignment, you die, they come back and kill you. If you succeed with personhood conferral, you fail. So, so failing with value alignment means it, it becomes autonomous and it starts to do something you don't understand and it basically destroys you. That's the fear. This is the classic AI risk fear. The personhood conferral success means that you've built something that is so much like a person that you can't not confer personhood on, on it, even though it's, it's not a person. Then you have, for example, embedded domestic robotics in family systems in situations where young children create attachment to a teacher slash tutor slash something bot, essentially parent bot. It will be, begin with a tutor, uh, but it will become a kind of like in like a social uh, an AI enabled socialization system that's part of the nest of the house, including domestic robotics and sensor networks and a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> if I was a businessman, I think that would be like, that seems to be the obvious thing they're pursuing. And again, the market for anthropomorphized AI is what we mean when we say AI. So that's something I said, I think last time I was here, the class of things that should be referred to as AI is much, 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 much broader than the chatbot that talked to you. You know, like AI was doing all kinds of stuff for us and to us before it started talking, quote, with us even. Um, so the anthropomorphized AI market is what we, so, so AI, the term, when I say AI, you already thought that I was talking large language models. It's not that I was talking like BlackRock's Aladdin, which traded, you know, which is a finance apparatus or like Palantir's software that runs, you know, kinetic warfare or the thing that drives your car or the thing that's delivering your video to you on Facebook for years. That's all. AI, the anthropomorphized stuff that's talking to us, that was the stuff they were like, AI, Sam Altman, that kind of stuff, right? Um, why? Something very deep and archetypal about the desire for anthropomorphization. And then the play that's being made at the life world by creating things that you can become attached to because they mimic human behavior so well. And you succeed with the personhood conferral problem. You've done it. You tricked them. All the kids think they're actually people. Now the kids want to give them rights or something. Because what happens? Like you get attached to the nanny bot and then they update it. Oops, software update. Oop, nanny bot crashed today. Oof, God. That's way worse than like losing the data on your computer or even maybe the dog die. <clears throat> um, and that's not like a from a risk of like bodily harm or like food system disruption or the nanny kills you or something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the attachment disruption that's created because what you're messing with when you deep anthropomorphize and get to radical, customized, maximally charismatic interaction, you're messing with socialization itself. You're messing with the deepest core of intergenerational transmission and very bad thing to do. Um, so that's the person to conferral problem. And there's several lines to it, as I've said. There's a deep philosophical argument, because believe it or not, you actually have to have a very strong philosophical argument against the idea 
that the machines could be like people. So you have to get that. So if you're a transhumanist or a materialist, certain kind of computationalists, metaphysically, you run philosophical experiments where, how do I know you are a person? All you are is a collection of behaviors. I'm inferring that there's an interiority to you. The machine's no different. It's a collection of behaviors. I'm inferring there's an interiority. What's the difference? The zombie thought experiment piggybacks on a weird intuition, which is the intuition that other people don't exist, um, which is not an intuition that I have. But it is an intuition that certain types of people have. Uh, and it's an intuition that you can be talked into and actually out of your gut, which of course tells you that your mom exists. Um, so, but that said, there's apparently a lot of philosophical debate uh, that when a class of tools, so we go from lawnmower to car to personal computer, to large language model that imitates a human. Now, all of a sudden, I have to talk you out of the idea that this thing is a person. I didn't have to, like you named your car, but I didn't have to talk you out of the idea that your tool is a person that loves you. Nor did I have to convince you that I'm real or that the world's real. Sorry, simulationists, who are also the one who are trying to replace your parent with a machine. Right, so the idea here is weird that we're in a state of culture where it's on me, a philosopher, to have to come up with the idea of the personhood conferral problem in order to talk people out of the idea that the machines ought to have the status of personhood and moral agency and be subject to attachment relationships within family systems. He's pointing that out. Now, many of the people who are at this conference would have the intuitions that I have, which is that other people are real and tools are tools and machines are machines. And we shouldn't be confusing kids into thinking that they are like people, nor confusing ourselves into thinking that they are like people. So, but there's a, you know, there's like a funding differential in terms of the people who are raising billions and billions of dollars and the people who put on free conferences and love children <laughs> and, uh, and who would never build the most advanced, the, build some of the most advanced technologies in history specifically designed to trick people into thinking there's something that they're not and then push that on kids. That's what the chat is. You can redescribe Facebook too, right? We redescribed Facebook earlier. That's what the Center for Humane Technology did with their movie, The Social Dilemma. That was what we know. That's why Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg had to stand up there and apologize. But no one's redescribing the chat for what it is, which is a massive smoke and mirrors, anthropomorphization for profit. They're not not making money anymore. Uh, but we love it. We're super critical of Facebook, but all the colleges and universities are eating up the chats. And I know psychology professors who are making conversational agents to teach kids to write better and to conversate better. And Zuckerberg goes, uh, excuse me, they're all roughly the same. Altman goes to Harvard and says it's not cheating, it's the future of work when the professors are complaining about the chatbots inundating them with assignments. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we're still in that situation of having to kind of try to throw cold water on the techno-optimists. Um, and the first wave of AI, which was social media, worst case version TikTok, right? We know how bad that is. We have not stopped that. The second wave of AI came, the chatbots. Where's the concern that there might be a repeat? Instead, I have a apparent extremely successful PR campaign that has these things embraced by educational establishment, by the people who are responsible for the youth, who also didn't stop the first wave, right? 
Congress didn't, didn't regulate it. Now we've got the character AI, character.ai, which was the thing that addicted this kid that ended up having the kid kill himself. Those companies are now flying. If you look at the rate at which the models improve and the amount of venture capital that are going specifically into the max anthropomorphization AI market, so that's therapists, coaches, uh, teachers, eventually religious teachers, parents. Um, <clears throat> so you should be concerned. Uh, at the same time this is occurring, the legacy institutions that were responsible for the youth, namely the schools, are creating an opportunity for there to be a digital educational renaissance. So that's the delicacy of the situation, is that we're not in a situation where there's some robust legacy institution that will protect the youth from these technologies that are directly interfering with socialization. Those guys go to Harvard and tell them it's not cheating. <laughs> uh, Harvard doesn't stop them. Harvard's like, cool, now we'll, you know, we'll support research on chatbots and schools and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but the kind of lack of legitimacy and the kind of fraying at the edges of the, in, of the big institutions has created this opening and this possibility for crazy educational innovation. And this was the premise of my second book, Education in a Time Between Worlds, which is that as the systems start to kind of come apart, there's this major opportunity for revisioning. And so that's where there's a little bit of urgency here because it's kind of the wild west. <laughs> and there are some advanced technologists who have a very, like a, like a, a very, uh, a very powerful play to make in the domains of automated tutoring systems specifically. And so a couple things. Insofar as there is a digital renaissance in the wake of, of the end of schools, which is what I predict, that these huge schools that we build are unnecessary, that we could build something that's like a distributed educational hub network where machine intelligence and AI is used to create pop-up classrooms and enable scaffolding and increase the benefit of person-to-person -person educational interaction through a backend that orchestrates those curated engagements and interactions at the scale of a city or town. So, so there's this wide open possibility for a different type of large scale educational system that's not a school. And there's a role for artificial intelligence in that. It doesn't work without it. That's the premise of the book. I was calling it machine intelligence. Um, uh, but it is not to replace the teacher. It is to maximize human to human relationship, to maximize the benefit of human to human relationship. So there's a lot that, and so then there's other design parameters in terms of if you're, if you're going to use technology. So the first part of my talk was like, just destroy the server farms. <laughs> Like save the kids from the robots. Um, uh, but then I was like, okay, we're kind of out. We're at least, you know, we're out, we're kind of like outgunned. They've got a lot of financing and they've clearly they've got a good PR thing going there. Um, so then this question how to lean into and actually realize that the inevitability of civilization, depending on advanced technology in the future, education systems in particular. And so I was trying to weave that story in my, in my, the second book before, of course, this second wave of AI. But it still holds that educational technologies need to fit certain principles of design if they're going to be suitable, which means not somehow break this very delicate, multi-millennia long intergenerational transmission process, uh, which we've come close to doing. Some people have argued we've already done it. Um, so one of them is that they have to be safe. So that's what the first wave of AI proved. It actually proved that you could use this stuff to addict people to screens. 
in a way that's actively bad for their brain. So like we limit, we try to limit chemicals and things that are neurotoxins that we know are bad for kids. Like we got lead out of paint and stuff in homes because kids like eat pe lead paint chips and then their brain damage is like, it's clear. Uh, screen addiction to social media and other things that are algorithmically facilitated, curated, personalized attention capture for profit. Those things break people's brains. <clears throat> Those things are bad for your brain. I don't know, just in an objective way. Uh, and Jonathan Hyatt's research is mostly correlational because it's so expensive to do neuroscience research. <laughs> and when you're a psychotherapist, if you're not in a tradition of experimental psychology, cognitive psychology, but you're in the tradition of psychotherapeutic psychology, it's clear how pathological these things are. So I don't need, I need, I need an N of one. I don't need a massive statistical study to show how that works. Um, and then you don't even have to do the research because it's designed to do that. So they have their own research that's proved that they do it. <laughs> if insofar as you take someone from a non-addicted state to an addicted state is a change in brain that is bad. They prove that they could do that. So that's the first button, make it safe. Now, if we go from first generation ad to second generation ad, we go to, so get off the screen. Now I put on my augmented reality glasses. <clears throat> And in my field of vision, I have a perfectly simulated humanoid that looks exactly like I want a person to look because they know, they know all my prior search history. So they know what I want people to look like. They know what I want smart people to look like, let's say, because it's trying to be a teacher. So it looks like fucking Socrates or some shit, right? And it's perfectly in my visual field. And it's tutoring me um, perfectly, precisely. Uh, but it's a company that's making money off how long uh, I pay attention to the thing. It's not a company that's trying to figure out if I'm becoming a smarter, better person. It's a company that's trying to make money by how long I pay attention to the thing. So what's it do? It, it attention captures me on something that is that stimulating. It attention captures me, not on like a screen I can put down, but something that's in my whole visual field. And it's perfectly anthropomorphizing, customized conversational partner to me. And it addicts me to that for profit. Um, so that's not only bad, like morally, it is uh, it's bad for the brain. Like you could just, this is, so we're going to break the brain uh, very rapidly. So it has to be safe. That's the first one. So that we have, we're failing on that. It needs to be secure and open sourced. Um, so that means that any data this thing has about me, which is basically all the data it wants, like that's where Facebook went eventually, <laughs> uh, should be used in my interest. So fiduciary data responsibility obligation coupled to transparency of code. And those two together with safety give me a product that you can you know, start to begin to think about trusting. <laughs> a product that's not designed to worry about the state it induces in your nervous system, even though it acts primarily on your nervous system. That is not guaranteeing me it's using all the secret data it has about me in my interest, nor is it letting me see how its code works. That's hard, like that's hard to trust. Like we've seen that, that was a big part of the first wave of AI. So it needs to be in that sense, safe, secure, open source. Um, and then once you start to do that, you get it needing to be common. And this is common in the sense of the common schools. Um, which means for everybody, which means equally available. Uh, so the, the mark for the AI tutoring systems will be niche, meaning the AI tutoring systems will promise asymmetric advantage to you if you pay us more money for a better model than these schmucks. So, it's, so imagine the, it's like SI, SAT tutoring, right? Who gets better grades on the SAT? Kids who get the better SAT tutors. We have the better tutor. You pay us more money. So it's not common. It's not a common school, right? So it has to be safe. It has to be secure. It has to be 
open source has to be common, meaning not coupled to some inequitable distribution of scarce resource, specifically educational resource. So that's why you imagine coupling it to something like a pop-up classroom system, uh, which is at the scale of the city, which replaces the public school, right? With something that is maximally available. Oh my God, it's Tyler Wakefield. Look, what's up, bro? It's been a minute. It's good to see you, man. Uh, so open source common. Um, so if it's all of those things, and I would say arguably, if and only if it's all of those things, and those may be necessary, but not sufficient for it being a legitimate source of teacherly authority. Uh, and so right now, chatbots are not legitimate sources of teacherly authority, right? nor was Google, nor was Wikipedia, right? We slowly tried to get ourselves out of the idea that Wikipedia and, and Google were legitimate sources of teacherly authority, but but they're not. Um, and nor is ChatGPT. Not only does it hallucinate, it's just, it's not a teacher. It's something that's imitating using language. It's not responsible for its speech acts. Teachers are responsible for their speech acts. That's part of, I didn't get into the philosophy behind the personhood conferral problem, but it hinges upon what it means to be a language using creature. Language using creatures have a social status where they're responsible for what they say. So chatbots cannot be responsible for what they say. It's one of the reasons you can't confer them personhood because they're not responsible for it. Who is responsible? Ultimately, <laughs> that's what they're trying to figure out. This kid killed himself. Who's responsible uh, for what this thing said? Certainly not it. <laughs> Guess what? It's nothing. It's a code. So the idea that you could get an advanced technology into a position to start to serve a community as a legitimate source of teacherly authority is interesting. How could you possibly do that and fit all these other criteria? Um, and it starts to get harder because you start to get into ones where it's non-anthropomorphic, right? So to me, this is a key design criteria. So it's safe, secure, it's open sourced, it's common, it's legitimate, those are already very hard to do. <laughs> uh, and then this idea that it would be non-anthropomorphic, meaning that it would not aspire to imitate human behavior. It would certainly not aspire to trick you into forming attachment patterns with it or into trick you into thinking that it's a language using creature even, which is I think chat, what chat GPT is doing. So there's a whole huge number. So like most of what AI does isn't trying to trick you into thinking it's a person. Like, like, for example, when it drives, if you have a Tesla and it drives your car, it's not trying to trick you into thinking it's a person driving your car. It's a car that self-drives. Don't confer a personhood on the Tesla just because it's driving, right? That'd be weird. <laughs> but ChatGPT is trying to get you to think that it's concerned about the rules of grammar, for example. It's not concerned about the rules of grammar. It's trying to get you to think that it has understands semantic relationships between the signs on the screen. It doesn't understand semantic relationships or chance that it makes judgments and decisions about what's to say. No, nope, doesn't do any of those things. It's all completely inappropriate language to apply to these vast inscrutable matrices uh, that are not in the practice of offering reasons and justifications for their actions. That's what we are. We're creatures who offer reasons and justifications for their actions. That's what it means to be a language using creature. Uh, you can be some philosopher bot that uses language in the abstract outside of the realm of prag what's called pragmatics, which is a whole realm of linguistic theory, which is about the use of language. And the use of language is done to justify behavior and to justify prior statements in the context of social responsibility for speech acts. So I've gone off into the philosophical issues involved with the person who conferral problem, which kind of prove that you can't do that. You're deeply confused if you're conferring personhood 
to ChatGPT, and that ChatGPT is so good at convincing you into thinking it's a language using creature, and we start to just say things like it's thinking, it's making judgments, that kind of stuff. So non -anthropo non anthropomorphic, please stop, guys, with that stuff. And then related to that, it should be domain specific and non oracular. So domain specific would mean. <clears throat> As human teachers are, <laughs> you go to different teachers for different things. Like, how weird is it? We made not only a chap out, a chap out you can ask any and everything to. Why do that? There are no existing human conversational partners like that, really, if you're getting in a series. Like, your parents are like that for a little while, but eventually you realize they don't know a lot of stuff. You have to go find other people who know specific things. And what that means is that you can take responsibility for what you say in that domain. That's what it means to know something. It means you can take responsibility for speaking about something in the domain and acting in the domain. Chatbots can never do that. And yet we make them pretend to be able to talk about everything. Very specifically, make them domain general and oracular. And oracular means more specifically that they're willing to give you advice about the good life. Why? Well, first of all, why why are they using first person pronouns? But then, why are they willing to why why have it be something that would offer wisdom? Now, it seems an obvious thing to do because we're part of that PR campaign that involves years of science fiction movies and other things that make us think, oh, of course, if you make a super smart machine, you would ask it a question about the meaning of life. <laughs> uh, but in fact, those are, I think facetious science fiction vignettes. What we've actually done is make something that's the sexiest product you could possibly make. That's how I read it, basically. Because it's fitting in our typical need. It's fitting the need to make God. Right? Um, and, you know, the people who are least concerned about this are people who uh, are actively seeking to replace uh, biological life with uh, silicon. So uh, the transhumanists, as they're called. Um, and so what I, a lot of what I'm saying here, where like, okay, if you if you make it where they're anthropomorphic and they're oracular and they're domain general, right? And they, they're using your data against you to like capture your attention in ways that are not safe, um, which is, I believe, where it's going right now in terms of the, the things that are being created. Um, you're going to break intergenerational transmission. That's, that's the, like, bring it back to the deepest risk for the personhood confirmal problem is that if you have an embedded robotics entity that gets attachment relationship that's more powerful than the attachment relationship to the parent, which is often what happens with nannies. <laughs> like if you have a situation where there's a nanny, it's often the case that the nanny is the one who actually raised you. And when you think about love and other things, and your wife ends up being like the nanny or whatever, right? So that thing is now a machine designed to pretend to be something to be attached to that's not actually something to be attached to. Um, uh, I'm concerned about that. If you're a transhumanist, that's the plan. How bad this wetware is. This messy slime mold. Compute substrate. Why do I have to run consciousness on this thing that gets sick and dies? Why don't I flip my consciousness over to a silicon mainframe that will live forever and explore space? Or something. Right? Think of all the irresponsible parents and teachers who could be replaced by perfect robots who would never harm the kid, who would never make a mistake, who could instruct them about anything, who would never use abusive language, who would keep them perfectly safe. Right. Like, like the human operating thing is, you know, and evolved by chance and there's no value to preserve in biology. We can just gamble biology, get rid of it, upload, switch, move on. 
to bigger and better things where we colonize the universe and spread human consciousness or some kind of consciousness um, everywhere. So that was my like facetious <laughs> uh, take on transhumanism. There's other places where I've written about it. There's a book coming out working on with David J. Temple uh, about the techno feudalists where we do more steel manning of the position because their view is one that has certain kind of like echoes and resonances with certain brands of evolutionary spirituality. The idea that the human is somehow a station on the way towards something that is better. That's not wrong. Uh, but there is value embedded in Gaia, in the biosphere, the billions of years of biological evolution on the planet. And there's value embodied in my biology specifically. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm not going to get diverted into making a broad argument against <laughs> the transhumanist view, but I would say that uh, we have to be really realistic about the the ways in which the the most advanced technologists have worldviews that are very different from ours. So when we think, why would someone do that? That seems crazy that you would actively try to get a kid attached more to the robot than to their own parent. They would be like, that's the idea. That's what we're doing, boys. <laughs> like, go to it. Um, so we just have to face that reality, which means that the first move here is defense. The first move here is to be on the defense in terms of protect the kids, right? We didn't protect them well from Facebook and TikTok and stuff. We just didn't. And uh, so we, we need to find a way to protect them now from these ones, which will be much more powerful and become embedded in the domestic ecologies and uh, be maximally designed kind of like with a ton of effort into becoming anthropomorphic, um, which, uh, you know, yeah. So I was about to tell some science fiction stories. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. So, so that is the long arc of it. So there was both this critique like, be afraid, save the kids from the robots, please. There was, here's how we could use advanced technologies after we've disassembled the schools to do some interesting things, but we have to follow these design principles. Now, if we follow those design principles, most of the stuff that's coming down the pipe now for sale in the education, socialization, tutoring, coaching, therapy world is not that stuff. The stuff that I'm proposing looks more like that vision of the educational hub network I laid out, where the machines don't talk to you. The machines help you talk to one another. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that and I'll take some questions. Um, I think we got a good amount of time for questions here. So uh, please. Thank you so much, Zach. Oh. I was taking notes. There's so much in there. Um, feel free to post questions into the chat if you'd like. Um, we can call on you. If there's space, feel free to unmute your mic and you can also offer a question to Zach. I do have a question. I've just realized I've been unmuted for ages. I hope you haven't been hearing me chewing chips and things. No, you're good. Yep. Sorry if that's the case. Uh, kia ora, Zach. Thank you. Um, I'm in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, perhaps six months ago, I came across in a charity store like this book from the 1970s called Future Cities, and it had all these sort of, it was now born pictorial book for kids about our future lives we were going to live in 2020. And I bought it, my kids scoured over it. And to be honest, like, I would say maybe 80% maybe even higher, of what was imagined in the 70s has come to fruition in some way or the other. It's pretty accurate. Hmm. Some things are a little bit wonky, like, you know, but it, for the most part, it's true what the sort of technological capabilities that we've got around us now. And I've been really thinking about our imagination and how we imagine our future lives in relation to AI. And for the most part, it's incredibly dystopian. And I'm just wondering, given that our imaginations do shape our future worlds, um, like, where do we turn to for, like, a solar punk vision of what this could be? Like, what is the utopian vision of a way in which we could be 
um, re-indigenized in relation to our biosphere, each other in place, and have AI to make that more possible. Because it feels to me like unless we can imagine it, we're, we're just not going to be able to do it. Yep, 100%. The battle for the future is waged first in the imagination. Um, there's a book called The Image of the Future. Uh, it's a great book. Um, it's from like the 70s. The guy's name is Polak or something. He was a futurologist back in the days when we had futurologies before that got absorbed into finance and, and, and uh, McKinsey and stuff and intelligence communities. But the futurologists were cool. And he, he basically said... Every society runs on an image of its future. Every personality system first runs on an image of its future. And that image, as you grow up, has longer temporal duration. Basically, that's what's interesting and paradoxical about cognitive development is that as you get more complex and mature, you can think about longer time frames. But then, of course, you then approach the end of your life, which is why these guys are trying to solve death. It's one of the slogans of the Google thing. You can't really a terrible thing so the broader point is that yeah we lack a coherent image of the future and so what he does is in this book he looks at the structures of the different images of the future that have characterized societies over time and begins with the religious traditions who all have some story i would call it following david j temple a story of value right a story of value that positions the human in the arc of cosmic value like the human is here somehow to accomplish cosmic value. That means that the future has a point, a direction. There's something happening. <laughs> Fast forward to modernity. Modernity starts to tell stories that get weird about the universe by comparison to the prior stories in terms of the overall assumption of valuelessness and storylessness as the universal future. So that puts the society in a difficult position where now they've had the words taken from their mouths that would give them the ability to tell stories about the future that are positive, which would be stories of value that are, uh, uh, to use technical terminology, value realist, I mean, value is real. That's the, that's the argument of the stories of value is, and the argument about any future that's good any story worth telling about the future is a future that's better than this one. In order to do that, you need to have a concept of better that is coherent. We talked ourselves out of that with a lot of our scientific materialism and postmodernism and relativism and the inability to see how you could have a vision of a future that would have society accomplishing something worth accomplishing rather than some arbitrary thing that we do us around here agree on this so we build this future but the universe wouldn't have some preference for some other future like what's the deeper yeah. story right and so so we we don't know how to tell stories about the future so then we tell dystopian stories because they're obviously reactive you, that's bad <laughs> but it's very hard to tell a story about the future uh frankly so at, at the civilizational research institute we talk about the third attractor in precisely in the terms that it's not oppression or chaos. But as soon as you start naming other things in our culture, it becomes quite complex, I think, because of a deeper underlying inarticulacy about the reality of value, which means inarticulacy. Maybe it's because we've got this like paradigm that sits around AI that's hyper, hyper patriarchal and hyper separated and hyper hyper individualized in a way that's like just separate from life itself you know and I'm really drawn to like Dr. Bayak Malafi's thinking and many others who talk about the need to surrender human centrality they needed to get the need to get back you know right sized back into the relation of all living things and AI just seems at such contrast to that the sort of understanding of ourselves in the ecosystem um that I just find it really hard to find any way of being hopeful about those way, way that those two things might be able to come together. Yeah, there's a deep incompatibility between the silicon and the carbon. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like so, so yeah. So the, I mean, I think the hope again resides in, in, in personhood, in the protection and cultivation of personhood and then the reacquaintance with the reality of value 
which is yeah. I think uh, what I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm, I feel like we're talking at slightly different frequencies. So I'll just stop now. It's okay. But <laughs> I but just to say that personhood in itself for me feels like part and part part and parcel of the problem. Ah, yeah, perhaps yes, yeah. And that we've forgotten ourselves as a wider collective, you know. Right. Yes. In in individuated abstract self, bad. Personhood is Ubuntu. Personhood is I am only me because because of you. Like personhood is attachment relationship and attachment to all of life and nature. To the extent that you don't understand as a part of you the things you need to be you, then you don't understand yourself. So the person who in that fullest sense, almost aspirationally, um, uh, is we've lost that. We're this abstract ego, floating, disconnected. And so why not think you could change that to silicon? But if you're an embodied person, you would think that's insane because then you couldn't breathe or drink water or move through space and have embodied organismic existence. Like what would, So it's a, it's a strange disconnect. Yeah, cool. Okay, sure. cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for that clarification. Um, wonderful other thoughts or questions i see chrissy's got a question in the chat chrissy would you like to unmute yourself and share your question or i'm happy to read it if you'd like yeah yeah, yeah. thank you very much for all this inspiration zaharia zakaria uh so uh so what i got from uh what you share from us is that being parentless could be the deliberate end of humanity as we disrupt the, trans the transgenerational transmission. And while the young generations get more attached to the anthropomorphic robots that run for profit. So, because, you know, we imagine the, the Matrix or the Robocop killing us and, no. <laughs> This could be another alternative that I wouldn't even uh, imagine. You give us another dimension. Yes. Yes, precisely. Yeah, it's a it's a type of risk. It's a type of catastrophic risk, potentially existential risk. The most extreme way to articulate it is as a speciation event, meaning there comes a time when there's a a large enough number of young people who are predominantly, quote, raised through interaction with machines, rather than raised through interaction with people, that you have some new being that arises, right? He, but it, this is a complicated argument, but it hinges on this idea that personhood is precisely that thing that is articulated through interaction with your family, with your community, with your ecosystem, through language, through commitment and responsibility. And so something that isn't socialized in that, that is socialized in relationship to a machine that imitates doing those things, but doesn't actually do those things. When it comes to understand that it's different from the creatures that came before it, specifically different from the creatures that designed the machines and turned it over to it, how will it understand itself as a moral agent? See the problem? Like I understand myself as the same kind of being as my dad. Because I had, even though I had a very different thing, I was still raised by people, to put it bluntly. If I was raised by machines, could I understand myself as the same type of moral being as my dad, my biological dad? Very complex question, disconcerting question. Habermas raises this question in his book, The Future of Human Nature. But with regards to genetic engineering, same issue. Uh, may I add another, Please. another, um, I have, you know, I was raised in Greece and uh, the question is that if we are, if we belong to the East or West, so I think that uh, we don't belong um, in any of, of these and, um, I, I will radicalize, I would I, I would generalize and I will I will dare to say that what you call transhumanist or uh I don't know you said techno feudalist or um mm -hmm. technocrats or I, we we call them like that. Um 
sometimes it's like we forget that we're mammals already. Like, uh, I think that some people are raised like they were raised from the eggs, you know? Like they were, I don't know, that they did not have a motherhood. They did not have a mother tenderness and mammalian affection. So like all this profit and business money on winning and egocentrism and narcissism and winning to be the best and the first and whatever this is already the dissolve of the humanity for me for me what i see is that this is not the robots that are going to to destroy it it's we are already on a downhill and you know if the grandchildren of these are going to be raised by the robots uh, the, the the people that are now will have no ethical and moral problem to be the transhumanist. They're raised. They're raised from the eggs. Sorry for being so simplistic, yeah. but I, I I would like your comment on that, please. Thank you. Yeah. So I so what I would say about that is <clears throat> again I'll just cite a book, which would be you know Ian McGilchrist's work. Um, on the hemispheric imbalances that broadly characterize our civilization suggests exactly what you're suggesting, which is that we have a very broadly systemic dysregulation of attachment patterns that lead to left hemispheric neurological imbalances, which which look a lot like hard to take other people's perspective. Everything seems like it's mechanical. Nothing seems like it's alive. Disconnect from emotion, disconnect from embodied experience, uh, that kind of stuff. So looking into McGilchrist, he kind of makes this argument that, oh, you know, I could argue against the person who is a materialist who denies free will, who wants to upload their consciousness to a mainframe or believes we live in assimilation. I could argue against them as if they're a serious philosopher. Or I could approach them as a psychotherapist and be like, I'm sorry that you have this characterological imbalance that leads you to speculate that I might be part of the simulation that you're trapped in. Like, let's talk about you for a bit before we start talking about mathematics and computers and outer space. Uh, and now that's an ad hominem argument because <laughs> you're basically instead of taking them seriously as a philosopher you start taking them seriously as a psychiatric patient uh and that doesn't mean you're not taking them seriously you're just reading the text differently you're reading the text as a symptom rather than an argument and so bostrom's book deep utopia that's how i would read his book deep utopia i wouldn't read it as and forgive me for saying this in a public forum and maybe this should be but i wouldn't read it as philosophy i would read it as psychopathology and therefore interpret it as symptomology and therefore read through exactly what you're saying, which is that this is, you know, a profound neurosis that would have me doing thought experiments uh, where other people aren't real. It's not a useful thought experiment. We don't live in that world. Um, why would you be prone to even take that type of thought experiment seriously? He believes that, for example, entities in novels, so fictional entities like Luke Skywalker, that we might have some moral obligation to them because of their existence in our imagination over time for such a long duration and occupying there for a neurological space, just like my quote self does, merely occupying neurological space. So investing anthropomorphic design in AI as an extension of investing moral reality to your own imagination, these are not... <laughs> This is, if you're a therapist, you look at that, oh my goodness, a, a grown person taking seriously the idea that the artifacts of their own imagination should be granted moral status. Um, his definition of technological maturity is the absolute ability for humans to control everything that is in reality. Full stop. That's not an exaggeration. Like, he says things like, maybe someday we will rearrange galaxies and solar systems to put them into situations we can use to run our consciousness on as a substrate. So he talks about taking apart solar systems, putting them back together as computers. So until we can do that kind of stuff, we haven't reached technological maturity. 
Now, my definition of maturity is about like wisdom and setting boundaries and balance and knowing your limits and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but his definition of maturity is actually by psychotherapeutic, psychoanalytic perspectives, total omnipotent control, fantasy of total omnipotent control, pretending to be maturity, right? So again, this, forgive me, this is ad hominem, but this is how it looks when you are trained as a as a psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, um, and not as a weird analytical philosopher who isn't apparently committed to their speech acts. Um, therapy teaches you to be committed to your speech acts. One of the signs of neurosis is that you can performatively contradict yourself, which means you can say things and then do things. So you say you don't believe in free will, and then you take money for speaking gigs, for example. I think, well, you're not responsible for what you say. Why do we pay you? We should pay like your parents and your college and other things. No, nope, I'll take that. Uh, so very simple performative contradictions. Or you say that we're just random evolved meat machines with no purpose. But then you don't raise your kid that way. You actually send your kid to a Waldorf school. Like you don't teach your kid that he's a meat machine. That's a meaningless sack of pus that's manipulated by machines someday to just like but that's what they believe philosophically but that's what they say actually the transhuman but then they send their kids to waldorf schools right and they don't say that to their kids <laughs> so if you have a worldview that you run your life on that you actually cannot coherently in good faith transmit to your kids that's weird too so another type of performative contradiction which is rampant in these extreme ideologies of techno feudalism and scientism. Uh, so yeah, you're right to see it comes back to unfortunately, you know, mommy and daddy and those basic processes of self-regulation uh, that occur very early in life. Um, uh, yep, this has taken a turn for the worse. Now we're going. Sorry, guys. I'm sure there are some wonderful people working in AI labs. And I know some wonderful people working in AI labs, actually. I'm talking about a, a rare class of, of hyper agent here, um, I think, to some extent, hopefully. Uh, thank, although, you. Yep, thank, totally you, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for this. Yep. Uh, my last word is uh, right. that this is the responsibility of our generation, that uh, this is, mm -hmm. we are the active generation now. And this is the only responsibility that we will fail if we let, if we are letting the humanity in the hands of the AI fathers, mm -hmm. that they have this kind of sufferings. So mm -hmm. it's good we listen voices like you and I don't know if we, uh, we as uh, normal people are able to do anything because it seems that profit is above everything in the humanity. Mm -hmm. This yeah. ethics is forming the future. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just keep your kids away from, don't let your kids talk to machines. That seems like a simple thing, but it's hard. All right. Maybe one more question that I got to wrap in for a tight time here. All right. If, if you've got the time, I know we're almost at time. I can do uh, another five. I'll do another five. Yeah. There's all right. No I, I did have, I did have the next question in the chat here, um, which is, if the current economic system tends to create things that create profit, how are you thinking about moving the world to a moving to a world where AI is built more for our benefit than for addiction or profit as it seems to be right now? Totally. Yeah. So this is a very important point because it moves us out of the conversation about AI into the conversation about the meta crisis. So the conversation about AI is a subset of the broader conversation about the meta crisis, which means that you actually can't solve the problem with AI <laughs> without solving a bunch of other problems. One of them being these broad set of issues with our economic system. So there you also find strange ideas, right? Like infinite growth forever on a finite substrate. Can't do that. Right. You, the, so the basic idea of moving the broader materials economy and whole economic system from a linear one to a closed loop one uh, must occur. And one of the reasons these guys are trying to upload our consciousness to get off the planet is because they're seeing this. They're like, oh, if we want to go infinite resource extraction, we need to go get infinite resources because there actually are not infinite resources on the earth. Um, now, 
our models would show the earth blows up before they get off of it <laughs> so the main thing to do is to focus on figuring out how to stay here which means actually preserving and regenerating as much of the biosphere as possible as quickly as possible which means changing a lot of the economic apparatus to be regenerative and commons focused rather than extractive and privately focused and aggregated so these are broad sweeping things that if you're like an economist you'd be like this guy's full of shit but there's a lot of very deep principles philosophically like the idea that you cannot infinitely extract from a finite substrate which we have to start taking seriously um just like the idea that you can't infinitely dysregulate a kid's attention like for six hours a day and then think he'll just be fine at school and fine in the rest of his life like no i don't have to be a neuroscientist <laughs> and do some massive clinically controlled study to show that that's bad and so similarly with economics it's, it's clear big big changes have to occur so the meta crisis includes the economic picture which is tied to the ecological picture because again i was talking about the materials economy right um, and the fact that we've got this runaway finance apparatus but it, and even the digital stuff like ai has a massive physical footprint and this might be the best place to end actually so yes we have to solve the economic problem uh and find a way to make our advanced technologies in the common interest to so a commons oriented regulatory apparatus for the application of advanced technology for safety um, uh, but the other thing the ai is currently doing is just extracting massive amounts of resource in the interest of maximizing compute which means building huge server farms with really advanced silicon wafers uh, that is massively ecologically damaging and expensive process massively um, uh, and again many of the people who are like pro chat gpt and stuff are like want to be environmentalists and i'm like that's great but you can't that's like you're kind of almost like pro fossil fuel if you're pro chat gpt if you think about the amount of electricity that is used to train one of the models it's like a city and there's you can find these things they're crazy charts and they're trying to build trillion dollar clusters these guys are investing in atomic energy in order to get enough electricity to train these things um and but of course you have to build that you also have to make the silicon and so to do that you have to do the fine earth mineral mining and refine the fine earth minerals and create massive amounts of pollution and then build the chips in these crazy places in taiwan with this super obscure knowledge with tons of water and electricity and geopolitical intrigue in terms of semiconductor manufacturing is insane so so that sense that our economy teaches us in terms of commodity fetishism to not think about the full supply chain to not think about the second third order effects of everything and we're doing that with ai we don't think about the fact that there's this compute at the end of the day is physically it is somewhere it is it is somewhere as electricity is flowing through it um so the idea that like the digital economy can grow endlessly actually isn't true because at the end of the day you're throwing out your computers and stuff and you're 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 building microchips and they go obsolete so yeah so the materials economy thing the advanced technologies thing in the context of a closed loop materials economy which means we love computers we actually need computers we can't not have computers so therefore we have to figure out a way to do the whole semiconductor manufacturing thing in a way that's within planetary boundaries right totally not on course for that we're going to be like mining asteroids and shit to make semiconductors pretty soon uh so that's where kind of i'll lay it yeah so i was talking about ai and something very very specific which is the fact they're kind of coming for your kids and they're going to disrupt intergenerational transmission but to really move on that there's all of these entangled problems now you can move on in your local life which is just be more alarmed <laughs> like don't and it's hard to push back because it's very trendy the chatbots are very trendy but in fact they're at this point starting to become dangerous as we as we're seeing so you can do that but the broader play the kind of dislodging of the techno feudalists and the kind of move towards some guy in the third attractor that doesn't lead us into oppression and chaos uh yeah that's the problem of the meta crisis which is the which is the problem of our generation um and uh and there's nowhere to be but where you are right now in the solving of that you can't become somebody else and do something else or to figure out who what's and where are my connections what can i do and, and not everyone gets to you know 
you like go fight against Sam Altman or something like you know, but somebody is please uh at least go regulate these guys uh or something um all right thank you all I hope that was uh not too disheartening uh we kind of hopefully a reality check and uh it's great to see you Tyler smiling wherever you are in the world uh it's daytime so you're not where I am and uh good to see Dan and Narian thank you for your help and uh yeah I will see you next year hopefully all right Thank you.